Hi everyone, I'm Charlie Melcher, the founder of the Future of Storytelling Summit, and we're excited to have you joining us here today for our weekly roundtable conversation. We're very honored to have Itamar Kabovi with us. Hi Itamar, welcome. Hi Charlie, hi everyone. So for those of you who don't know Itamar, he's the executive director of Palablis, the astounding modern dance performance company, which was founded back in 1971 at Dartmouth. Palabalus, uh, at Palabalus, Itamar has uh, created and co-curates the criti critically acclaimed International Collaborators Project, which opens the choreographic process to artists and thinkers from diverse fields. Recent collaborators include Art Spiegelman, Basil Twist, the MIT Distributed Robotics Lab, and the band OK Go. Itamar currently focuses much of his efforts and time on securing the company's transition into a sustainable laboratory that conveys creative minds to produce imaginative physical entertainment and distribute it on diverse platforms. Itamar, it's really an honor and pleasure to have you with us today. Thank you for being Thanks here. Thanks for asking me to join. I'm thrilled. Um, we also have some wonderful other distinguished guests today, and I'm going to just ask them each to introduce themselves quickly. Kyle? I am Kyle Gilpin. I work at the Distributed Robotics Lab at MIT. We look at big, large systems with lots of agents. In our case, it's robots. Uh, when we collaborate with Blablos, it's, it's actors and performers. And we look at how we can uh, essentially control those agents to do really interesting things. Very cool. Thanks for being here, Kyle. You're welcome. Hi, Nicole. Hi, uh, I'm Nicole Broder. I work for the Story Pirates, an education company based in New York and in Los Angeles. And we take stories written by kids and collaborate with them to put out new great content into the world. Fascinating. Glad to have you with us. Thank you. And hi, Rachel. Welcome. Oops, Rachel, you're muted. Sorry. <laughs> Can you hear me now? Yes. I'm Rachel Dretson, and I'm the executive producer, executive producer of Arc Media, which is a documentary production company here in Brooklyn. We produce a lot of content for PBS, and um, in recent years have been experimenting with doing some web-based, more modular um, and interactive storytelling that goes with our documentaries to, to uh, various, with various rates of success. So I'm interested in talking about that. Well, great. We're, this is going to be a really fun conversation about collaborative storytelling. And I wanted to remind anyone who's watching us that they're encouraged and welcome to share their questions with us through our Twitter handle, which is FOST.org. Uh, and we'll do our best to address them. Uh, so to get the conversation going, Itamar, you and I have talked a little bit about the process of authorship at Palabalus and how you create a dance and tell a story. Would you mind sharing a little bit about how that works at Palabalus? Absolutely. We're fundamentally interested in a group creative process at Palabalus, which means that we're almost always looking at um, a number of people making something together. And what that does is rather than having a group of people decide ahead of time what it is that they're going to make, we very often agree that a group of people will spend a certain amount of time in a studio generating material and then the process of telling a story really becomes the assemblage of the material that was collected during the work in the studio rather than the construction of primary material in order to already serve as pieces of a story. Um, and this process, it seems to me, is a very different kind of authorship. It's sort of a process by which you're really pulling and collecting and assembling and curating and juxtaposing, um, editing essentially, rather than deciding ahead of time with intention what your complete narrative is going to be. So, so your choreographers don't show up with a clear vision of what they want to create. It's really a collaborative process to create a dance. That's correct. And in fact, we don't start with music. We don't start with a theme. We don't start with anything. We just start with a time to be in a studio and a very definite period of time that people must remain in the studio in order to make a piece and a deadline. And whatever happens in that time is a sort of document of that period. And it becomes the story, a kind of journal 
of the experience these people had together in the form of some kind of a performance. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm going to just interrupt. It sounds like someone has a plane flying through their office. Uh, there we go, that helped. <laughs> uh, good, so back down on Earth now. Uh, so, so is this similar to the process of, say, creating a documentary film? Uh, Rachel, you, you have such amazing experience making documentary films. Uh, do you go through that same process where you just open up and explore and then see what you've got and make the film from that? No, <laughs> I would say <laughs> not at all. I mean, I think there are some some similarities. Um, you know, I, I think there's definitely more of a bias towards authorship and traditional narrative in documentary um, still, partly because, you know, we're generally um, dealing with, t certainly my company generally is dealing with television broadcasting, which is still a pretty one-way street. And um, at the same time, we've increasingly been trying to incorporate more open-ended um, methods of gathering stories into our process. So generally speaking, when we, we start we start a documentary, we start with um, an idea, a subject, um, we then go out into the field, as it were, and we gather a lot of material, and I think the, the overlap here is that often what happens when we're gathering material and shooting our footage is that our story and our perspective change and shift, um, and I think a good documentary filmmaker is open to that process happening, and then we bring it all back into an edit room, and at that point, it really just becomes a very, um, you know, authored process. The, the director um, and the editor shape the material. Um, we have increasingly been playing with other ways of gathering material. Recently, we produced a, um, a big series called Makers, which was on PBS a few months ago about the women's movement. And Makers started as a audience-driven um, series of videos, which were um, gathered by the and curated by the filmmakers for a year or a year and a half before the documentary was made. And the documentary was made out of that material. Um, I did a similar process with a film I made called Digital Nation. And what I would say about that, and I can go into more of it later, is that um, I think that the, that the web based material, which is really what happened to the sort of modular interactive stuff, was very successful. But the actual final broadcast additional documentary was much less so. Um, and I think that's a really curious, interesting thing to explore, sort of how to fuse those two processes together successfully. Mm. What do you attribute that to, Rachel? It's <sighs> a really good question. Um, you know, I think in both cases, the material was fun. To, I think the way that you see your material coming together when you start your gathering your material is very seminal, very important, right? I mean, I don't think there's such a thing as a completely open-ended process where you don't know where it's going to end up being. I think it's very important to know when you're going into that room, that studio, Itamar, are you making a dance piece that's going onto a stage or are you making something that's going to be on the web? And I think it's hard to do both. It's still hard to do both. And um, in both of these cases, we went into this process thinking we were doing both. And in the end, I think we were doing one much more successful. You know, Itamar, I'm oh, sorry, go ahead. I was just thinking that I think we now are in an age where we're interested in taking essential ideas and exploring them in many different media and in many different platforms. And sometimes the assumption is that any big central idea can be translated into any form or medium. And I think what one finds is that certain media have certain characteristics that allow them to be better than other media for certain kinds of stories of certain kinds of form. Mm -hmm. And I think it's important to be really sensitive to the formal or genre questions that are defined by the technical or just you know, the limitations of the, of the particular medium that you're working in. No question. The tools impact the stories you tell. For sure. For sure. Um, in, in my, one of the reasons I was so excited to have you here to talk about uh, your process of collaborative storytelling is as I see some of these really interesting new forms of crowdsourced storytelling that happen online, um, so things, for example, like the Johnny Cash Project uh, by Chris Milk and Aaron Kobland um, and their Exquisite Forest, another one of their projects, uh, where they set up 
some parameters, but then they sort of open it up to, to the web, to anyone to participate and contribute. Um, and, and there's some really amazing and wonderful things happening that way. But a lot of traditional storytellers that I see, people who are more used to or grew up in a tradition of linear storytelling, uh, where there is one author or or tour, uh, feel very challenged and threatened by this, and are very worried about the outcome, or feel like there's nothing good that can come from that. Um, and I'm I'm a big believer that we're moving into this phase where there is this new form of storytelling that is going to be somehow collaboratively created, uh, and and we're still just figuring it all out. But that someone like you and Palabalus in, in dance or people in improv or other places have actually been playing on this edge for a long time and, and have figured out how to successfully navigate that kind of collaborative process. And so I feel like there's there's real lessons that we have to learn or that, that some of these new digital storytellers have to learn from, from some of the work that you do and others in, in fields similar. Yeah, I mean, there were two approaches to this, I think, that we've taken. One is something that I think was linked to in the announcement for this session, which is something that we did with MIT called UP, the Umbrella Project. And um, essentially what we did is we, for those who haven't seen it, um, we uh, picked, gave 300 umbrellas to 300 people and the umbrellas were all sort of given the possibility by each person to change the color of your umbrella. And then we, on a crane way up in the air, put a um, camera with a screen kind of drive-in movie style that projected what the camera way up on the crane saw looking down at 300 people holding 300 umbrellas. And then we asked these, played music, and asked these 300 people to move around and change colors and gave them instructions and sort of gave them various very simple tasks. And what we found is that this group of 300 was able to achieve a very beautiful um, uh, kind of performance uh, that you can see on this video link. Um, but it was not something that anyone had really intended or conceived, but just by following very simple sets of instructions, the conditions were met for this kind of amazing improvisation, 300 strong, to take place. So that's sort of one approach to, I think, how, you, how we've been interested in involving people in the resulting work without necessarily having them have training or knowledge or anything like that. The other is something we did with OK Go and Google Japan a couple of years ago where we created a video that actually became a kind of app or had a certain kind of functionality that after watching the video or while watching the video, one could use our dancing to create a message. And that message was then a message that you could send in a danced video form to anyone you wanted in the world. And to date, 12 million people have, have, uh, have used that uh, kind of feature. So that's a kind of interaction that you show. You make something, you show it to people, but you leave a part of it open for it to be filled in by the group. So those are just two examples from our world of where and how we've tried um, to gracefully involve a crowd or a group of people or an audience in a more active way. But I think finding the categories of this process and looking at what how one does it in different media is uh, phenomenally both important and interesting to talk about. Kyle, you, you actually collaborated with Itamar on that on the UP project, is that right? That's correct, yeah. So we uh, helped with the production of the umbrellas themselves, which have, like Itamar mentioned, red, green, and blue LEDs inside. And in addition to the, to the human aspect, my background is on the robotics side. And so we're very interested in how you can kind of unite the control of humans to form interesting geometric patterns and how you can get robots to do the same thing. And so in addition to this live performance that we did at PopTech where we had 300 people, we've also built simulators which try and do the exact same thing. And so we can really look at that, that synergy between what we can do with humans and what we can do with robots and try and bring those together and get the humans to behave more like robots in some ways and the robots to behave more like humans. And so it's this kind of interesting uh, meshing of those two concepts and looking at 
you know, humans are great at some things, robots are great at other things, and, you know, what is that intersection where we can really excel in both fields? And it's amazing because essentially what they created, um, Kyle and the folks in Daniela's lab, is an app, a, a, a piece of software, that essentially you put in the conditions of a dance or the rules of a dance for 300 people, and it will essentially model what an improvisation of that dance following the rules you've given to your 300 people might look like. So it's not one course specifically, but suddenly you have a piece of technology that helps you imagine what a crowd might do if given creative power to do something in order to be able to learn how to be in dialogue with a crowd <laughs> that you don't know and don't rehearse with, which is a new kind of dialogue. Um, it and does the crowd work as predictably as an algorithm? Uh, <laughs> no. I think you know the answer to that. <laughs> <laughs> but that, that's, that's what keeps it interesting, right? I mean, it's, it's fun that you have this algorithm that works perfectly in simulation, and then you take it out to real people, and it's just, you know, sometimes it's the same, but more often than not, you get completely unpredictable results, and that's, that's really the interesting part of it, is that you think you have this perfectly crafted set of rules and instructions, and then, you know, it all turns out to something else, and oftentimes that something else is more interesting than what you initially envisioned. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm really interested in this changing relationship between the performer uh, or the, the story and the audience, and certainly in this digital age, as, as the Internet's empowered people to be able to to have some impact or at least an expectation of some sort of participation, um, how that's forming new types of stories that you guys are actively working on. But I'm just curious if any of you have any thoughts about how, um, how your relationship as storytellers has changed now that the expectations of the audience have changed. Itamar, I mean, you're still making dances right on stages, primarily. Sure, I mean, although we're very actively thinking we're now doing a project with Penn and Teller, the magician and illusionists, and, you know, it's interesting people think that it would be the magician part of their work that we're most interested in, when in fact what we're fascinated by is their ability to interact ongoing during their entire show in a very dialogic way with their audience. Their audience ends up playing a huge part in each of their shows, believing, disbelieving, being fooled, having an incredible, you know, each of these things, they become massive characters and an evening where they get a great character from the audience becomes a fantastic show and an evening where they don't becomes a less interesting one. Mm -hmm. So it has to do with the unknown and managing the unknown of a piece that you want to involve and yet as you said earlier, I think for people who have been used to growing up and working in a world of authorship in the traditional sense, it suddenly becomes completely weird to work that way um, because you suddenly seem like you're giving a huge unknown control over the outcome of what it is that you're making. And that's, that's, that, that, that involves some discomfort, I think. At the risk of, can you guys hear me? At the risk yes. of sort of sounding like a, a fuddy-duddy, um, because I think I am definitely someone who's trained in linear storytelling and, and come from a medium that still embraces it. I guess what worries me about this is not that there aren't incredible opportunities for collaboration and excitement um, in many, many forms, but really sort of what is the place of a good story well told? And I still believe that audiences, readers, uh, viewers um, love to sit back and be told a story and that that process um, you know needs to remain intact and that, that, that and I think Edmar you said something really interesting about sort of leaving a space for people to then invent collaborate adapt, you know amend whatever but but retaining that initial intact entity um, which feels to me at least in my media like a more successful uh, road or path to follow than that in which we're all creating something together all the time. Um, 
I'm curious about what you guys think of that. Particularly you, Charlie, you're in books, and I imagine there's some of those parallels there. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that traditionally great literature always left that space for people to invest themselves in That's it. That's true. Right? You would read those words, right. and you'd have your whole film going on in your head of what you imagine. Um, and many people uh, don't want to lose that. They, they love that collaborative process, that, that dance between themselves and the author. Um, on the same hand, or by, by another token, I think the experience of growing up on the internet and having the opportunity to be able to participate and have an immediacy and, a, and uh, be able to contribute is enabled and, and it created a new expectation amongst a certain generation. And perhaps you know, we are too old, right? We were formed in a period that was a text-based print-based linear world before the web, which was this mesh of information, was, was invented. Or certainly before we, we didn't have the opportunity to grow up in it. We, we've grown up since it's, it's, you know, it's come since we've been around. So, um, but I see that there is an expectation now for people to participate. You look at the growth of the gaming community where people are um, engaging in story worlds where they can really be part of that world. Uh, and they want to participate. Uh, and so I think that we are leaving gradually a world that was one-way linear storytelling moving into something new, something that is uh, a web of, of participation and collaboration. Uh, and I'm not saying that people that a great story well told is, is lost its currency. It's still unbelievably powerful and still the way the majority of the world is happy to experience a story, um, but I see s the signs, the seeds of this kind of paradigm shift that's starting to take place. Just like when we move from morality to literacy, you know, we're now moving from that text-based literacy to this new kind of digital literacy, and, and I believe that it includes things not just like participation and collaboration, but I'm also actually a big believer that it includes um, coming back into our physical form. I think that we spend a lot of time reading with our eyes or watching with our eyes and kind of being disembodied physically. And I, sorry, I'm going off on a tangent here, but I feel it's appropriate since we're talking with the executive director of Palabalus um, that we are moving into a phase where people are going to physically interact again with their, with their media. Um, so the keyboard is going to find its way out and become like the typewriter and things like Connect and other natural user interfaces that let us you know, physically engage with the media experience we're having are going to bring us back into a kind of uh, dance or, or, or perhaps it's more like orchestration. You know, I imagine someday you'll be making a film by gesturing with your hands and bringing in cuts and music and you know, all those titles and uh, all this kind of stuff is going to take place. And, um, and so I'm really excited personally about helping to foster that community and learn more about it and try to encourage it. And, and so I see the work that Palabas does, which is this collaborative form of storytelling. And yes, there are parameters, but they walk in kind of not knowing what the hell they're going to make, and they make something amazing that everybody can watch and say is a great s story of, in, a, in a way. And, um, and they do it in this beautiful physical form. And I just, in a, I think in a way that's, that something about technology is going to take us back to something very organic to what it means to be human. And dance is, goes back probably before even music, you know? <laughs> like, it takes us so back to what we are originally uh, in the human experience. So, sorry, you, you opened me up and I, and I went, but uh, that's, no, that's my take on it. I think for, from the point of view of physical communication, it's very true that there's something about the way in which literacy is decreasing and visual stimulus is increasing, I think, right now as a result of how mediated our experience is. I think we, we generally, I, I think there's a kind of education with visual literacy that we now are hungry for and always feel like we want to be able to put stuff together visually, whereas I think that text for many people becomes sort of less relevant in terms of their day-to-day -day ability to express themselves. But I must say that I also, Rachel, was convinced for myself about the possibility of this paradigm shift that Charlie mentions by observing first and foremost my own change in my own appetite for stories 
and how I'm interested in digesting them. And I have found myself distracted easily, even unless I'm in perfect condition to, to hear a wonderfully told story, I'm very easily distracted and go to kind of interrupt my attention with some other stimuli. And I think that's a reality that I have to assume I'm not the only person that is just every week that advances watching television differently and reading differently and the same device is the device that I read the book on and the device that I check my email on. I mean, all of these things which one could obviously create artificial ways of avoiding, but the natural tendency is that you start just slipping into a different approach. You know, we thought at one point, how could we not read the paper every day as a paper that's delivered to our door? And of course, there are many people who still enjoy reading the paper that way, but a fewer and fewer number, I think, every day. And those people are getting that information from the New York Times or whomever they're getting it from in a different medium. And I think that has an effect. And I can't imagine that over time that won't require almost every storyteller to come to terms with the reality of the changing audience. So, Yeah, I'm um, sorry. One of the things, can you guys hear me? Yes. Yes. Great. Uh, one of the things I'm fascinated with as we approach this paradigm change, and it's something that we've been, I don't want to say struggling with, but working with, is all the, uh, you know, a lot of the creator tools that are out there, I'd love to hear more from Kyle on this, are creating this passive experience. You know, they're recording one person on a video screen, and we're working with it, we're bringing kids in and trying to capture that magic in the moment, but it's it's hard. And so I'm curious about how the hardware is going to change to create this more physical experience and how we're going to be able to interact with that in the future. I feel like that's where we're heading and this robotics is amazing and fascinating. I think we just had a, uh, someone join us <laughs> very <surprise>. excitingly. Yes. <laughs> the, the magnificent Clay Shirky, is that you? <laughs> that is me. Hey, Charlie, how are you guys? <laughs> hey, Clay. Hi, Clay. Welcome. Hi, Clay. <laughs> Don't have my lighting right yet. <laughs> Rachel? How are you? I'm good. How are you? I'm good. It's been a long time. Yeah, no one did too long. I, I feel like we've just had sort of a celebrity join the mix. I'm yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so welcome, Clay. We're, we're right in your sweet spot here, baby. We're, we're yeah, <laughs> no, I was, I'm, I'm, I'm digging the social value of the umbrellas, like the, the yeah, you know, what Itamar was saying in the video about everybody senses that they're a participant, but no one senses that the entire project is theirs. Exactly right. And we were trying to talk here, Clay, with Rachel being sort of a more traditional still in a more traditional narrative medium of the documentary broadca broadcast documentary and a sort of sense in which we're noticing on ourselves a changing relationship towards the acceptance of story in terms of our own lives. We were sort of wondering about how the audience is changing and what is going on to sort of gradually shift audiences from being satisfied, as Rachel said, with a phenomenally told, traditionally delivered story to an audience that is expecting some kind of different relationship to what they're participating in. Um, and that seems like, you know, an, an interesting thing to understand so sociologically. How does that shift happen over time? How is that paradigm shift? And, really and taking I just, place. I just want to say I feel like I'm in a Woody Allen movie where I can now refer to Marshall McLuhan and have him talk to the guy on the line uh, authoritatively. So, Clay, you are <laughs> the person to step in now and say, well, let me tell you about the changing nature of the audience. <laughs> you know, I mean, it's funny. My colleague Jay Rosen uh, uses the phrase, the people formerly known as the audience. And I think that encapsulates a lot of the change, right, which is that... Uh, <laughs> Uh, you know, to, to, to take Rachel's original observation, I don't think that there's actually been a decline in people's willingness to be satisfied by an amazing story expertly told. What I think is that a lot of non-amazing stories, non-expertly told, got a pass because they were in the same 
main channel where there was no way to talk back and there was no way to talk sideways. And so if you were in the presence of a master storyteller, whether it is you know, uh, uh, someone sitting on the stage with a microphone and nothing more, or it is an entire opera stage for your pleasure, but it is, it is engrossing, there is no need to add to that experience, and there are still people willing to have those experiences. But what's, what's happened, I think, is that the, you know, as, as we've moved into an environment where people can not only consume, they can also produce and they can share, you're seeing people just rebalance what it is they're interested in and, 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 and engaged with. And I think that instead of it being all storytelling because the media we have privileged that, what we're seeing now is a mix of storytelling and participation, a mix of uh, being able to see yourself in the, in the environment and sitting back. And that opens up all this exploration for new, for new forms. Whoa. Oh. There we go. Thank you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, You'd be into we could probably titrate where we are in New York by seeing where the siren appears and disappears. <laughs> I'm right yeah. next to the Manhattan Bridge. I'm really sorry. <laughs> with like windows <laughs> all around me. <laughs> I'm sure it looks beautiful. <laughs> um, so, so Clay, that leads me to think that um, uh, we're going to get up a little bit off of our off of our couches, right? That where this era of the couch potato is sort of slowly ending, and and does that mean we're all going to end up looking like blobless dancers? Oh yes, absolutely. Uh, any minute now, I'm going to get six pack abs. Um, no, no, certainly not. No, I mean the thing is, there is still expertise, right? There is still a sense of people who do things well and people who do things in a, in, in, only in a mediocre way, and there are, there are all kinds of experiences where. Being, being active and engaged but not an expert is actually a good experience. But then there are all sorts of places where letting the experts do what they're good at, stuff that none of us will be able to, will be able to touch, like Palabla's dancers, um, is also part of the experience. I think the interesting mix comes when you find a way to have some kind of participation by the people formerly known as the audience. But it's tied in together with the experts so that it creates a satisfying experience that isn't just, you know, me, me dancing badly or Palabalas dancing beautifully, but that there's something about me getting out of my chair and also there being some expert framing, like the Umbrella Project, that creates something you don't get at either end of the range. I think that's that's interesting because with the Umbrella Project, what you don't see in the video is that there is somebody giving some high-level direction, right? In Amara, it's it's Matt in the background with totally. a megaphone and a speaker saying, okay, as a group, we want you to organize in this way. He's not giving individual instructions to person A, person B, person C, but a much higher level direction to help the group along because otherwise people would just kind of be lost. And so you need that expert in the, in the loop. But there's still a lot of autonomy in the loop as well. It's always been our assumption also that groups of different sizes do things well and do things badly depending on their size and particular constellation. And so in the way that sort of different species of animals are extremely good at certain things like running fast or tearing meat apart or whatever it is that their particular species can do, you find that a group of 300 can do certain things that no other kind of group can do, but it also has a certain aspects in which its intelligence as a sentient being that can be addressed is very limited. There's only so much you can ask 300 people to do. And so in a way, I think part of what we're talking about is also the granularity of story and the kind of detail and sort of different perspectives because the more we have these crowd-based stories, there's also going to always be some growing value, I think, for one person on a stage talking to 30 people in the audience for two hours live. That very, very simple anti-technology-based approach to storytelling isn't going to lose its value, as Clay says. It's just going to occupy a different relationship to the rest of your of your absorption of stories in different contexts. So what, the but Edmar, sorry to interrupt you, but what I'm interested in is, and I, I, Clay was sort of hitting on this, is the interaction between those two things. That person 
to me, the most successful, I'm having trouble thinking of them right now, but I feel like the most successful examples of this for me have been the two-hour performance, right, by somebody delivering a monologue in a traditional way, followed by an explosive online collaborative experience inspired by that performance. And I do feel like that marriage, that partnership between what I call a good story well told, but really what is authorship and participation is a space that isn't necessarily, we're not talking about enough. Um, it's not one or the other, I guess is what I'm saying. That something can be created in that space. I'm going to mute myself because I'm, I think I'm very loud. When you worked on Makers, Rachel, I felt like what was interesting there is that this was a documentary project that had hundreds, is it hundreds? I don't know how many profiles there are there, but um, it's a, a, a chronicle of the women's movement for those who don't know, and it has a very, very strong web component, and it also had a broadcast documentary component, and it also also had a sort of very large live component where there was a big ceremony at Alice Tully Hall in which Gloria Steinem spoke and people showed up and there was sort of this live thing that launched it, which wasn't just an opening night party, it in and of itself was a performance. So that the entire project seemed to take on, Rachel, I think a quality that there was a live component, then there was a huge online component, and then in the middle of it there was this kind of traditional expert storytelling component. And that, that, that seems to me to be some, a direction that more and more kinds of topics or stories, I know you're now working on um, an ad figuring out how to adapt uh, a book. I don't know if you want to say a word about that, but I think that becomes, again, raises this set of questions between these things. Well, it sounds like we're talking about something that's more, what I don't like this term, but sort of transmedia story now, something that takes place over different platforms, different media, and, and all sort of support one another around a similar set of characters or ideas um, or narrative. Uh, I mean, one, one question I wanted to sort of ask this group specifically is about the changing relationship with the audience. Um, so for example, the UP project, um, when did you talk to the 300 people after they had become part of the performance? Was their experience and satisfaction different because they were participating, they were the content, they were the storytellers, versus if they had just sat in the auditorium and watched Palablos do a dance? I think, I mean, I would like to say absolutely, Kyle, you can certainly jump in here, but the sense was that when people do very little and they feel that it has an impact on the outcome, they don't need to do a lot to feel like they were part of it. And I think that sometimes it's as little as just reflecting an image of people back to themselves as being participants in a group can literally have all the performative power of them being asked to do something much more complicated. So I think it's a night and day difference in terms of the passive sitting in a seat and watching a show, but it could be a very little action of, inter of, of involvement that then suddenly makes you feel like you had, you, you made an impact on what happened here tonight or in this experience. There's a, there's a section in that video where there's a woman who is moving her umbrella and watching the screen and finds herself in the large image and the look on her face is beatific. I mean it really, it just says, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm participating locally but I can also locate myself globally and I have some sense of how my, you know, my neighborhood and my neighbors join up to this big thing I see and you can just see on her face that it is a kind of experience that she's enjoying, but also it looks surprising to her. It looks like, oh, this again, I always love it when this happens, but rather I'm, I'm seeing something or feeling something that I don't usually get to see or feel. And, and I agree. I think that people are really uh, looking for this deeper, more, more extreme experience. Like I think about, for example, Sleep No More, where rather than going and watching a Shakespearean play, people get dropped in this set of several stories and they get to experience and explore and you know, literally be immersed in the experience. And uh, they come out of that with their, all their senses heightened in a kind of rush. Uh, that is hard to replicate in a, in a passive, you know, one-way linear experience. Right. There's a tension, though, between, I mean, as, as, as easy as it is to say, there are all of these new tools that we've been given. There's, I think, a, 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 
uh, you can end up with a desire to say, all the old stuff is now going to be wrappered by this new stuff. But there is a basic tension between uh, story, really the absorption of narrative, and kind of playful participation. And in a way, the, designs, the set of design principles, which I think we don't have right now, or at least I haven't seen well articulated, are something to do with when is this storytelling in the sense of somebody needs to know the narrative in advance and convey it a piece at a time to, to the people understanding the story, and when is this opening up to a kind of playful interaction where the choices being made by the, by the audience affect the outcome. Uh, there was years ago a, a, a theater piece that, that ran for about a month, Anne Bogart piece, called No Plays, No Poetry, which was a bunch of Brecht's writings about the theater, but not anything, none of his, his consciously aesthetic output. And in the beginning, you walked into this enormous warehouse, and you could go watch these scenes unfold, and they unfolded in no particular order, and you, would, you could watch one happen over and over again, you could switch, and then later the audience came together and we watched the same piece together. And Bogart needed both halves of that experience to get it to work. But, but the, 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 you know, the design principles we need are when is closed-ended the author or the choreographer, the director, or what have you, is shaping the thing the same way for everybody. And when do we say actually playing in the field of possibility is the, is the, is the big aesthetic option here? We often think about this as a tension generally between story and improvisation, mm -hmm. where, you know, which is at the core of any kind of live performance, where you're essentially driving some larger structure forward, but you've got a little room inside there for certain kinds of idiosyncrasy. And I'm sure, Nicole, that you guys also create, again, these Petri dishes that provide some structure, but then encourage accident which in, in, in a way is a form of involving an audience through the feeling of, uh-oh, something just happened that I didn't, that wasn't planned. And at that moment, something new is going to emerge. And I think that the live experience that achieves that is generally much more satisfying for people today than, um, than a live experience that doesn't, where they're able to get a very well-told story or a perfectly structured and presented story that's all planned quite at a, quite a high level, um, whereas this kind of spontaneity becomes a new, a new question. I don't know uh, if you find that, Nicole. No, absolutely. We create the structure, just a very simple structure of story where we ask you know, kids for a beginning, a middle, and an end and ask them to fill in those blanks and then whatever they say in the moment becomes this amazing story. And it's you know so obvious to the audience what's happening because we literally say what happens next and get a suggestion and take it from there but you know backing us up is a really intensive training process for the actors where they're all on the same page in regards to style and then this really strong structure of beginning middle end character obstacle and then everything else is from the room uh, and every Everyone feels that even if they don't give a suggestion, that they've taken part in this experience to create a brand new story. One of the things that, that's <clears throat> so interesting, I think, that you just touched on, Clay, um, and, and you too, Nicole, is this, that traditional storytelling has these structures that are established. There's a beginning, a middle, and end. There's certain, you know, the three-act play. The, you know, we, we've developed these over years and years, and, and we understand them all now. And as we move into this new world of participatory storytelling, we haven't developed those, those structures, those um, clear rules that we can work in. And uh, cl clearly that's an area that we could all contribute to and, and it's going to grow over time. Um, but one of, one of the classic structures that we do know of is kind of the cliffhanger at the end of the story. And um, unfortunately, I'm going to have to refer to that now to, uh, as we end today's conversation, uh, wanting more, you know, and leaving the audience hungry for, for more discussion uh, because we've, we've gone over our time and, um, and I so appreciate everyone's participation. This has been really an engaging discussion, and I look forward to the next one.
uh, with all of you. So thank you, everyone, for joining us today. Um, we hope you'll come back to uh, our weekly roundtable conversation with the future of storytelling and also to the actual live summit, uh, which is happening on October 3rd uh, this fall. So again, thank you to all of you for participating. This was a really tremendous amount of fun and an honor to be here with everyone. And I uh, look forward to seeing you all again soon. So thank you. Thank you Thanks, so much. everybody. Take care. Bye-bye. Thank you.